Mr. Governor of the great state of North Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I feel like I sometimes have a unique space, particularly on this side of the aisle, in that uh, I've been trying to be a good-natured pain in the Department of Justice's rear end my entire adult life. Uh, and since I've been here, I've worked on things about law enforcement's use of third-party data brokers, geofence warrants, civil asset forfeiture reform, acquitted conduct, uh, and exculpatory evidence, safer supervision, BOP oversight. Um, I've fought for extra money for public defenders, and when uh, Mr. Ivey's talking about those guys he was, ta he was talking to in church, I was the guy at council table with him. So... Uh, Not here, and maybe. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just saying, like, I spent a significant portion of the early part of my career as a public defender yeah. and dealing with that. So I take this stuff seriously. And I uh, earlier today, you said it is our view that audio recordings are essential and people are less likely to participate if they know those are going to be turned over. It will have a chilling effect on the cooperation of future witnesses. It's happening right now, and career DOJ officials uh, have told you that, correct? Yes. Um, but the second part of that is when you want to. Uh, and the reason I know this is, and I hate the fact that oftentimes, in order to get answers to some of these questions, we have to go to these highly political and profile case. But we introduced the FAIR Act, and we had all but one member of this committee vote for it. And that is requiring Department of Justice to record DOJ, ATF, FBI, DEA, and the Marshal Service to record custodial interrogations and non-custodial interrogations. And we know that the DOJ interviewed Paul Manafort full times and never interviewed him. By the way, it's not only the DOJ. When we sat in a deposition, uh, Hunter Biden's lawyers requested that it wasn't audio recorded or video recorded. Now, I have my suspicion why, and I think it's because things read differently than they sound. But in 2004, the FBI issued a report in favor of recording interviews because of the following benefits. Reduce court time for officers to appear in suppression hearings. Improve court efficiency with fewer pretrial motions to suppress statements and confessions. Officer efficiency due to no longer needing to review and piece together notes from interviews. Reduction in lawsuits stemming from frivolous claims of misconduct. And in 2014, and this is all before you were the attorney general, but you're in the big chair and we're, we're last, so we get that. Uh, President Obama created a presumption that interviews of federally deployed persons should be electronically recorded. The problem was, and the reason we introduced this bill, is the DOJ's determination of in custody was after arraignment before trial in a federal building. So my question to you, when, which we can start with, is why, if they're so essential for you to record them that it will chill extra or chill future cooperation, the recording in and of itself has no benefit. I mean, it has benefit to your guys, but when you don't have to turn it over, you are arguing that recordings are essential. But you and I both know in a criminal case that if you have the recording, I'm gonna eventually get it as the defense attorney. So why, I, I'm trying to figure out what your guys' policy is on recording of interviews and recording of witnesses, because if it was what it really says it was, we wouldn't have had to introduce the FAIR Act. Well. You say uh, there, there, there are very few things that are before my time, but that one does seem to have been before my time. I don't know the answer to the policy about recording. Personally, I think recording in interviews is a very good thing to do uh, for all the reasons that you say. But of course, as a former defense attorney, you know that the defendant has to agree to the, to the recording of the interview. Well, we've been a part of it in this committee, too. And I get the rules of evidence in a criminal case are different than an adversarial between the Department of Justice and Congress. But our frustration and my personal frustration is whenever you're in an adversarial system, the other team doesn't get to determine what you det what is the best evidence. And I'm not talking about the best evidence rule. We've had that conversation forever. But it's fine, but when we know it exists and we ask for it, and then you say, I mean, and some of this is timing too, and with all due, I mean, with all due respect to everybody, we get the transcript the day before the first hearing. We get executive privilege put into place literally the morning of the contempt hearing, and we're looking at it and saying, listen, we know it exists, we want it, and you're saying that there's some political reason for, for us not getting it, but I will argue, and I will argue at the rooftops, that the real political reason is to not give it to us. Because anybody in any determination of fact anywhere in the country, 
knows that if you have audio or video, that is better than a transcript. If you have a transcript, that's better than notes. And that's what the committee is trying to get here, and that's what the committee is being stonewalled from when we know it exists, and that's why we're so frustrated. And I personally believe that there's a very, very specific reason that executive privilege was, was instituted the morning of the hearing, because the difference between this and a criminal case is we actually have a potential time clock, and that's the November election. And with that, I yield back. Could, could I respond? Yes. And time for response? Yep. Yep. Sorry. I know, but I, I like talking to you, and this seems like a good conversation, if you don't mind. So two things. One, with respect to the timing, uh, since the Clinton administration 30 years or so ago, it's been standard that uh, assertions of executive privilege occur um, uh, right before the vote in order to provide the constitutional accommodation process as much time to run as possible. Um, so, so that's the answer to that thing. The answer to the other is the Supreme Court has said that in order to protect the separation of powers under the Constitution, the Congress has to have a legitimate legislative purpose for the things that it's requesting. And what I'm still not seeing, I understand why you'd rather see the audio, hear the audio, than listen, than read the transcript, but I, I still do not understand a legislative purpose. I can't see how listening to the audio will make any difference respect any legislation you have in mind. If you want to have a statute that requires special counsels to turn over audio all the time to the Congress, you can pass that without listening to this audio. Um, and I don't see any, there's no element of the uh, impeachment resolution that will change with respect to information on the audio. The words are the same on the transcript as the audio. That's my explanation. I am actually excited to see potentially how that gets turned out in a, the more respectful way. By the way, it would really, I, actually in this current political environment, I'm not sure if it would help or it would hurt, but the FAIR Act's a really good piece of legislation and your support would be helpful. And with that, I'll, I'll look into that. whether we're following the FAIR Act or not. That's a very good point. Your career DOJ officials are following 